Good morning, everyone. Let's go ahead and find our seats, please. And we'll get started this morning. We want to welcome you here to Esperanza First. And uh, especially if you're a visitor with us this morning, please uh, make sure you, you get with some of our welcomers and, and uh, get a, a visitor's packet. We're glad you're here. We're glad everyone's here this morning. Today's, uh, I want to let you know, today's going to be a little bit different service today. Uh, we gather with, uh, with heavy hearts today. Uh, as many of you know, uh, Kyla Ankenbrook last Tuesday was returning from San Antonio with her daughter August, and they were involved in a vehicular accident uh, west of Brackettville, and uh, August did not survive. Um, so we gather with heavy hearts, but we have a hope. We have a hope because she is with Jesus now. And that hope is more solid than this earth that we're standing on. Um, also Friday, um, Martha Markle, one of the founders of the, of the church, passed away. I believe she was 95. And so the service is going to be a little bit different today. At 12 o'clock, we're going to have a prayer meeting. We're going to have some uh, friends and family from some of our sister churches here in town joining us at 12. Uh, and uh, so for that, the, the beginning of the service is going to be a little bit different. The offering will be taken during the song service while it's just our, our Esperanza First family. Uh, the, then we'll have communion after some more song, uh, a short sermon, and then uh, we'll have the prayer service. Uh, if you can stay, uh, we, we welcome you. We urge you to stay, even if it's just for a short time for that. If you need to leave, we certainly under, understand that. Um, well, as I said, uh, while our hearts are heavy, we have a hope that's more sure than the foundation, than this earth that we're standing on. God told us in, uh, in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, in verse 3 and 4, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble, with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. And so would you join me in prayer? Father in heaven, we thank you. We thank you for the precious blood of Jesus. We thank you for your great love for us that's given us a hope that's, that we will be with you. You are eternal, and we, can, uh, we know that we will be with you forever. And that gives us a hope to, go, to weather all the storms that we may go through here on earth, Lord. So, Father, I pray, we pray, pour your comfort out on the hearts of those who are hurting right now. Pour out your strength and your healing for lives because you are alive. You defeated death. And so, Father, for in that reason, we lift up the name of Jesus this morning in gratitude and praise and in worship and just being with you because we need you. We thank you that you're here with us now, Lord Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. I ask you please stand up and greet each other and uh, as their worship team gets ready.
Psalms 23, 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I, do, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. over to the other side of the lake and they launched out but as they sailed he fell asleep and a windstorm came down on the lake and they were filling with water and they were in jeopardy and they came to him they awoke him saying master master we are perishing and he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water 
and they ceased, and there was a calm. But he said to them, where is your faith? And they were afraid, and they marveled, saying to one another, who can this be? For he commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. And we can have the same confidence that those disciples got to have, to know where our faith is, because our faith is in Jesus, and he is trustworthy in every storm, no matter how much peril it seems is coming. We can trust that God is faithful.
come forward and I'll pray for the offering. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for those who are willing to give with generosity. We pray that you pour your blessings down upon them. And we pray that the offerings that they give us, that you multiply them and put them towards your good work. We love you and thank you, Lord. And thank you for everything that you do for us. In your son's Jesus' name, amen. Revelation 21.3 And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful.
thank you so much for the fact that you hold us now. The fact that there's a hope in the resurrection and we live in that hope. God, I pray that you would make sure that we don't fall. Help us to be faithful when it's hard to be faithful. Help us to stand when it's hard to stand. God, help us to trust in you. And Lord, as we, during this time of communion, take some time to remember what it cost for you to redeem us, I pray that we would respect that offering. God, help us to live worthy of it. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. Let me have a seat. Our communion, we, we uh, practice what's called open communion. In other words, you don't have to be a member of our particular congregation, but if you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're welcome to join us. And the way we do it is we come up and we get the elements and go back to the seat, and then we'll take them together. So as they're playing, if you would come and get the elements, and then we'll take them together in just a few minutes.
I'm going to be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. In verse 23, the Apostle Paul is telling that church, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord Jesus, our freedom from sin is free because of what you did for us. I pray that those who may not know you, have not placed their faith in you, would do that today and have such freedom through your broken body. In 25, in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Father, thank you that you gave your only begotten son to die for us on the cross, to be our propitiation, to be our substitute, to be the sacrifice that took away our sin. Now, Father, help us to walk worthy of that through the power of the Holy Spirit. We ask it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's stand together, please. thank you for this time that we can gather together. Father, I pray that your spirit would be with us. Your Holy Spirit would use me as a vessel to bring words of encouragement to this group of people that have gathered together to worship you. I pray that your Holy Spirit would move in the hearts of the people that have gathered. I pray that your Holy Spirit would move in the hearts of those who may be watching. Father, that all of us would hear a word from you today, that we would be encouraged by you and your word today, that we would be encouraged to stand in the battle, to stand strong in the faith, to stand strong in your armor, in your righteousness, in your strength, in your courage. We need you, Father. In times like this, we have nowhere to go but you. We are so thankful that we have a good and gracious God that we worship. We're so thankful that we have a God who knows the beginning from the end. And even when we don't understand the storms we're going through, as the disciples did not understand, we know that you are indeed the fourth man in the fire with us. And we praise you for it in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. We normally have been going through a series in the book of Genesis, but uh, given the situation 
with the Ankenbrook family that happened last Tuesday, I wanted to change the message. And that's actually coming on the heels of what happened to Brittany last year. And she is still in a nursing home receiving treatment and therapy and uh, still working and praying that God will do a miracle in her. We have a lot of celebration and we have a lot of heartache. And our congregation has been in both places. Last week we celebrated the arrival of Isaiah to the Ward family. This week we grieve over the loss of all that. And it's just hard to understand, Father, how these things happen. But Lord, I pray that you would help all of us to just hear a word from you today. So in Ephesians chapter 6, it's all about the armor. It's all about making sure that we are protected from what these kinds of things can do to us. And, and I hope that God will use me as a vessel today to bring these words of encouragement to you. And I hope that you will have your ears open and listen to what he has to say to us. This is a verse that is probably pretty common to most of you. A passage that maybe you've prayed before, that you've read before, and, and even sought some comfort from it in the past. Don't let familiarity cause you to grasp what God wants you to get today, okay? So I'm going to read and just kind of do it a little bit differently than normal. Um, just going to kind of read and talk about the verse as we go through. And a lot of people said it's going to be a short sermon. We can only hope. Verse 10, chapter 6, it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So when things like this happen, we are to draw our strength from God and not from ourselves. We're not to expect that we have this strength within us, that we have the ability to face these things. We don't have the ability to walk on water. We don't have the ability to calm the storms. But God does, and he is our God, and he's taking care of us. And so we need to remember, draw your strength from him. It's the only place you can get it. We need to learn to protect ourselves with God's armor. And you mean, what? Protect myself from what? Protect yourself from the wiles of the devil. Here's a little Greek study for you. Wiles, what does that mean? It's the word methodos. The word methodos. What comes to mind when I say methodos? All your linguists. Method. So don't let the methods of Satan distract you or knock you down or keep you down. That's what he's saying. We have to be able to stand, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the methods of the devil. Now, what are they? Well, first of all, in John chapter 8, it says that he's a liar. So whatever his methods are, they involve lying. They involve twisting the word of God. They involve telling you that God doesn't care anymore. They involve telling you that God has abandoned you. That he's condemned you. But he hasn't. It's a lie. God stands faithful all the time. He's the father of lies. He used his lying in Genesis chapter 3. He lied to Eve. Deceived her caused her to believe that God was trying to deprive her of something. He lied. He tried to twist God's scripture when he came to Christ after the temptation in Matthew chapter 4. He twisted the word of God. And of course, Christ, who is the author of the word, was able to succumb or bring the devil down. And the angels came to take care of him. What kind of a person, what kind of methods? Well, in 1 Peter 5, 8, it says that he seeks to devour you like a roaring lion. He is lurking about, trying to find a way to pounce on you. And while he's doing that, he's making a lot of noise, roaring, and 
yelling and trying to scare you, trying to find a way to pounce on you. He's an adversary. The adversary, your devil. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 5. There's some things that I want you to see. Besides just that, I want you to see what it says beyond that verse. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Verse 9, I think, is important. Resist him. Resist the devil and his lies. When he starts roaring at you, just put that hand out and say, stand back. And remember, you're not alone in the suffering. Brothers and sisters all around the world have suffering. Many people within our congregation have suffering. You're not alone in it. I think he wanted us to, to realize that. The same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, but may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. And to him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. So he may lurk about trying to grab you, trying to pounce on you. But you have what you need if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior. You already have what you need. But it's hard to, it's hard to accept that you have what you need while you're going through the trial, isn't it? While Jesus was sleeping in the boat, those disciples thought they were going to die. How does he work, this enemy? Well, from the book of Job, we know that he has it. The tactic of piling one thing on another. He wants you to reject God. He wants you to turn away from God. It'd be great if he could convince you that God doesn't even exist. And so it's not just simply gives you a hard time with one thing. He hits you, and he hits you again, and he hits you again, and he hits you again, and he does everything he can to make you fall. Just kind of picture some big boxer standing here, and somebody keeps hitting him, keeps hitting him, keeps hitting him. And, but through his strength, through his muscle, through his, his body mass, he's able to take it all and not fall. God himself is already, he's, he's giving you that body mass that you need. He's giving you everything you need to stand when these kinds of things happen. But understand it's going to be one blow after another. That is the method of the devil. That's his method. If he just did one thing and walked away, it might be easy for you to get back up again. He tries to make sure you can't get back up. Look with me back in chapter 6 of Ephesians Verse 12, when you're in a battle, you need to know your enemy. It's just a basic war tactic. I mean, your, your strategy, you, you've got to know what kind of people am I battling. The more you know about the enemy and his strategies, the better off you're going to be. The closer you're going to be to victory. You need to know the battlefield. You need to, need, you need to know all the idiosyncrasies of this battlefield. And when we're looking here at verse 12, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. The battlefield is not here with flesh and blood. It's against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. You see, it's not your neighbor. It's not your spouse. It's not your siblings or family members. It's not your doctor. It's not your lawyer. It's not that guy who's driving too slow. They're not the enemy. Who is the enemy? <laughs> Principalities, powers, spiritual darkness, these beings of wickedness, host of beings of wickedness. That's who the enemy is. And what what we see is the flesh and blood. We get all entangled with fighting over the flesh and the blood. And, and, and instead what he's saying is, no, no, no. This is a spiritual battle. It has to be fought on a spiritual level. It has to be up here, not down here. 
And if you try to fight this battle down here, you will lose. You will fall. So you have to fight a spiritual battle on spiritual grounds. The only chance of doing that would be, as it says in verse 13, therefore, because that's where the battle is, because that's who you're battling against, therefore, take up the whole armor of God. Why? That you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. What is it that God expects from us or desires for us? Is that as the enemy attacks, as blow after blow comes, what he wants is for you to be able to stand. Stand like a soldier in this armor watching things bounce off. Doesn't mean there won't be any pain. Well, we definitely have to watch out for chinks in our armor. So let's look at what that armor is. Verses 14 through 17 talk about the armor is. Stand therefore having girded your waist with truth. <laughs> Listen, the culture is not the guardian of truth. The Holy Spirit is the guardian of truth. There are not many truths. There is one. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. One truth. There cannot be contradictory truths. People say, well, that's your truth, or this is my truth. No. There's only one truth, and that's God's truth. Jesus said, sanctify them. How? Through thy word. Thy word is truth. God's word is truth. Jesus Christ is the living word. He is truth. What the culture is feeding you is not truth truth and you need to make sure you don't let that seep into your mind and confuse you have yourself girded with actual truth Jesus Christ and the word of God that's what you need truth righteousness righteousness protects us from accusations we are righteous in Jesus Christ 2 Corinthians 5 21 he who knew no sin he gave him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. Do you understand what that means about you? If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you have put your trust in Christ and what he did on the cross to cleanse you from sin, you are righteous. And you say, preacher, I live with me, and I'm not sure you're right about that. But you see, that's not how Jesus sees you. If you are in Christ, God the Father sees you in Christ. Jesus sees you as one that he suffered for, died for, and cleansed. And the Father sees Jesus and says, you're righteous. That's why he can say, we are already sitting in heavenly places with him. It's a done deal. It's over. Will we sin? Well, we probably will. And when we do, we need to get back up. Righteous man falls seven times and gets back up. Keep in mind that you are, in fact, a righteous person in Jesus Christ. And when you fall, get back up. And start standing again all over. Because it's him, not you. Verse 15, we have the gospel of peace. The gospel of peace, so I look at that, your, your feet shod. It means put your shoes on, put your boots on. What kind of boots? The gospel of peace. When I think about shoes, I think about where I'm walking, where I'm going. And I need to have my mind focused on the fact that I am walking in the spirit, not the flesh. I need to make sure that I am walking the path that God has set for me. Proverbs says, don't turn your eyes to the right or to the left, but focus. Stay strong. Move forward. Don't look at all this other stuff. It's just noise. It's just roaring of the lion. Ignore it. Stand. And stand strong. Knowing that the peace that you have in the gospel. That is a message that saves lives for eternity. It turns lives around. The incredible piece of the armor is knowing what your mission of peace is. Verse 16. Faith. Says in verse 16, above all, taking the shield of faith, 
which which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. I look at this and I say, faith, the shield protects my heart from doubt. It protects my heart from the lies of Satan as he throws them at me one after another. That shield of faith just keeps catching them and they just fizzle and drop. That's how it should be if I have that armor, if I have that shield of faith. It's an important piece to have because when things happen to us that are unexplainable, there are no words to explain some of the things that we've been through. When that happens, we need that shield to catch all of the fiery darts because when you're down is when that roaring lion will try to pounce. And you don't want him to pounce. So stand. Salvation, verse 17, talks about the helmet of salvation. When I think about that helmet of salvation, I'm thinking about the fact that now I'm protecting my mind, protecting my heart, protecting my mind. I'm going to tell you, when I talked with Kyla and with Justin, they both talked about their salvation. Justin said if he hadn't come to Christ a couple of years ago, he would not even be able to consider going through this. His salvation protected his mind. Kyla said, I know I have my salvation. That salvation can protect your mind from that roaring lion and all of his noise and all of his lies. Always go back to it. Because what does that salvation tell me? That Jesus Christ loved me enough to die and pay the penalty for my sin. And he did it. And he did it. I didn't do it. Nothing I did could possibly buy my salvation. There's not some sort of a scale where I've got good and evil and I've got to try to get it. No. With God, there's only one thing, and that's Jesus Christ. He's the only mediator between God and men. He's it. So if you're in him, you can know that your salvation is keeping you for heaven. One day, you will be with him forever. Then we have this weapon in verse 17. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It's the weapon that helps us to cut down that lion as he's lying to us. It's what Jesus used in Matthew 4 for his temptation. It's what you and I need to use day after day. We need to know the Word of God so when the lies come through, we can cut them down. No, that's not what Scripture says. No, that's not what the Word says. No, that's not what God says. No, that's not what he meant. You're trying to twist something. But you have to know it to be able to use it. Just because you have a sword in your hand doesn't mean you're protected. If you don't know how to wield that thing, it doesn't help you. So know the Word. It's part of the armor. Verse 18 and 19. Verses 18 and 19, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. 1 Thessalonians 5.17. Pray without ceasing. Luke 18, he says, I, I want that people would pray, always pray, and not to faint. Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 6. Don't be anxious, don't be worried. But everything, bring everything to him in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. And then the next verse, that's when the next verse comes. When you bring everything before him and lay it at his feet and say, I don't know what to do with this, here. Then the peace that passes understanding, the peace of God that passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds. Prayer is crucial. So I didn't ask you anything. Must have got too excited. Siri wanted to get in on it. Listen, it's going to guard your hearts and your minds if you pray. But here's what happens. It happens to me, at least. Sometimes when things happen, tragedy strikes, it's hard for us to pray. But he's telling us this is part of the battle. Praying, praying, praying. Never giving up in prayer. It'll guard your hearts and your minds. You are a child of God. If you know Jesus Christ, you're a child of God. You're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. 
You're cleansed by the blood of Christ. Uh, you're living in the hope of the resurrection. And when you're in trouble, you go to the Father. You allow the Spirit to even pray for you when you don't know how to pray for yourself. So he's saying he wants us to pray, in verse 18, pray for everybody, uh, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me, in verse 19, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. And for me. I am not in any way, shape, or form the Apostle Paul, but I can tell you that as Paul was saying here, I need you to pray for me. Why? Because very often when preachers stand in the pulpit or when they're dealing with people one-on-one, -on -one, they are tempted to just kind of, you know, make everything blessed. And God loves you and he just wants you to have a new car. It's, I, you don't know how many times I said, Lord, are we going to do this again? Why can't we just tell them something nice? And it's easy, and some preachers do that. It's so, so much easier to love somebody who just tells you why well, everything is wonderful. Everything is not always wonderful. Christians, if you came to Christ thinking that life was going to be easy after that, then you didn't read Scripture. He says, count the cost before you even do it. He, he warns us that we're going to be in a battle. Law enforcement agents may wear some sort of a bulletproof vest to protect them. If they get hit, they will get hurt. They may fall to the ground if they get hit. But it increases their chances of survival. And so it's worth having. It's worth having that armor on. Even when something sneaks through once in a while and the pain seeps in, it's better to have the armor on so you can continue to stand for the Lord. I want to read you something because one of the lies of the devil is that God doesn't care anymore. Romans chapter 8. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? And that's one of the things you have to watch. The devil will try to condemn. He'll say, this happened to you because of something you did. No, it didn't. It happened to you because you have an enemy who's doing everything he can to knock you off your feet. Who is he who condemns it is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him. Who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life. Nor angels. Nor principalities. Nor powers. Those things we already talked about in Ephesians 6. Nor things present. Nor things to come. Nor height. Nor depth. Nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us. From the love of God. Which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. One of the greatest lies the enemy likes to tell you. Is that God has abandoned you. He's condemned you. He left you alone. It's a lie. Cut it down with that sword that he gave you. Father, you're an awesome, mighty, wondrous God. There is none like you. There's no competition out there. You are alone. One God. Father, I pray that you would help each and every one of us to love you with all of our heart and soul and mind. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would help us to recognize what we have in Christ, what we have in the Holy Spirit, what we have in the salvation that you provided, 
And Father, if there are any here who have not trusted in Christ for their salvation, I pray that you would touch their hearts today by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let your word cut through to their hearts and give them truth. Now, Lord, as we continue with our prayer time, I pray that we would gather together as saints in Christ, people who love Jesus Christ, people who are trusting in Christ for their salvation, gathering together because you have said if we gather together and pray in unity that you would meet our needs. So that's what we're going to do now, Father. In Christ's name, amen. Okay. Uh, uh, if y'all could find a seat. In fact, if some of you, if you wouldn't mind moving forward, that would help a little bit. We're going to have, um, that'll make room for people coming in. It'll also help with the live stream. So that Kyla and those who are watching at home can actually see a little bit more. Sarah's going to be walking around with a phone. And um, on, on, she's actually going to be on the line with the Ankenbrooks on a FaceTime. So they can see. So if you would, please just come. Fill it up toward the front. Chris, I thought I saw Chris somewhere. There you are. Thank you. Chris, that yellow microphone is for you. Chris Summerfield is from Del Rio Bible. Uh, he is um, on staff there. He is one of those who has felt the pain of what's happened. The Ankenbrooks are part of his family also in terms of military family. So I've asked him to say a brief word and to pray our first prayer. And then I want to talk to you about how we're going to conduct our prayer. Go ahead. Check. All right, thank you. As Pastor Jim said, I, I'm a pastor. I'm one of the pastors at Del Rio Bible Church. Um, what an amazing sermon. <laughs> In fact, um, some of the things that you just said are, are some of the things that's been on my mind and my heart lately that I'd like to just share. But I will keep it brief. I spoke with, uh, I spoke with Justin last night just to see if there was anything that he wanted to pass on. And um, he told me some stories, told me how they're doing. And I'd like to share some of it with you. First, he wanted to pass on that the support has been overwhelming in a good way, that, that they feel so loved uh, by this community, by, by the community that's in Waco. He talked about his salvation. He talked about trusting in the Lord. He knew that he wouldn't be able to get through this without God. That their whole family, while they are hurting, they are strong in the Lord. What an amazing, amazing testimony that is. Uh, I, I visited with them at the hospital a few times, and uh, I saw Justin just started hugging him. And we couldn't let, let each other go. We just held on. And he started whispering in my ear. He said, I'm so sad. I'm so sad. But there is no darkness. And he just kept saying that over and over again. And it, it, we just couldn't let go. But, but what an amazing display of faith to have uh, something so tragic happen and, and for him to be able to, in the midst of it, say that. What an amazing display of trusting in God during heartbreak and tragedy. Uh, when we see this type of tragedy, when this type of heartbreak happens, we look face to face at the brokenness of this world. And it is hard to look at. It is hard to look at. And when we see the brokenness of this world, we only start to try to figure things out. 
because that's what we do. We, we want to orient ourselves. Uh, we begin to grieve. We begin to mourn. But at the same time, we ask questions. We, we say things like why. We say things like how. We, we want to know what's going on because we know that this isn't right. We see that it's not right. And we see the brokenness. And about the only thing that we can say is that this shows us that we are in need of a Savior. That someone needs to set things right. Someone needs to fix the brokenness of the world. And we know that that someone is Jesus. That God saves us by grace through faith. And we know that, that Jesus will return. Therefore, when we grieve, we do not grieve as people without hope. But we grieve as people who know that God will bring Jesus and all those who have fallen asleep in him. When we come face to face with the brokenness of this world, things become really hard. And, and we begin to doubt, possibly. And, and, and it's so funny that you ended your sermon with these verses because these are the verses that continued to flood to my mind. The Romans 8, 38 and 39. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? We need to know that that is true. We need to remind ourselves of that. We yearn for the Savior to fix the brokenness of this world and to make all things right. And when I think about that, I think of John's vision in the book of Revelation. Revelation 5, 1 says this, I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back sealed up with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the book or look into it. And John says that he begins to weep. He begins to weep. Why? Because this book had to be opened for the, pro for the progress of, re of, of reconciliation, for the progress of all things being made new, for things to be set right. This book had to be opened. It's part of God's plan. And he looks around and it looks as though no one is worthy. No one is worthy. And the apostle John begins to weep. Much like some of you have wept recently. Like Justin and Kyla and Avery and Bryn, weeping. Because you see the brokenness and you just want it to be made right. John weeps. But look what's said. An angel comes to him and says, stop weeping. Behold. The lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. Amen? There is one who is worthy, and that is Jesus, and he will set things right. He will make all things new. And this drives all the assembly to worship. It says again uh, in, in verse 11, John records, Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea, with all that is in them singing to him who sits on to the throne, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Amen. That is the hope that we have. Because we know that we will not live in this brokenness forever. And we worship Jesus in the midst of the pain, and in the midst of the trial, and in the midst of the suffering. When I spoke to Justin last night, um, 
he told me the story that he wanted me to share. He said the night before the accident occurred, August came in his room and, and just wanted to lay down with him. And she wanted to hold hands, and she took his hand. And they were holding hands, and she was falling asleep. And of course, when, when you're holding hands, you know, your hand gets a little sweaty. And he thought she was asleep, so he started to pull his hand away. And she just reached and grabbed his hand again and just didn't let go. And I told him uh, the discussion of his faith and, and Kyla's faith and everything that they were going through just reminded me uh, of one of my favorite hymns. It's, um, he will hold me fast. And I said, that, that, that story about, about August holding on, that, that reminds me of this hymn. So I just want to read a couple lines to you. It says, when, when I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter would prevail, he will hold me fast. I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path. For my love is often cold. He must hold me fast. I can't help but think that as August was holding on, to Justin's hand. God is holding them right now. And God's not going to let go of them. And I look out and I see the face of so many people that are, that are grieving and mourning, and I know that God is holding everyone here too. And he's not going to let go. He's not going to let go. Heavenly Father, it's, um, it is so hard it's so hard to stand here before people that, that love the Ankenbrook so much and, and, and be able to speak and not weep. God, it's with, it's with such, such heavy hearts and pain that, that, we lift, that we lift them up. Kyla and, and Justin and and Avery and Bryn and the family that are mourning that has experienced uh, the pain of losing such a precious child. Father, we ask for your comfort upon them, uh, for your peace that only your spirit can bring. We pray that, that their faith may not waver but, but continue to strengthen by your grace. We ask that their hearts may be flooded with hope as they look forward to the joyful reunion that awaits them someday. We pray that your mercy and compassion will be upon them. That you would continue to surround them with a community who love them, listens to them, and supports them. We pray for healing within the body of Christ. This community that, that grieves and mourns with them. Lord, just, just as August wouldn't let go of Justin's hand, we know you won't let go of them. Oh God, will you remind us of this? Will you remind us of your faithfulness and your love? And that your son Jesus is worthy. He is worthy indeed. And he will make all things new. And he will set all things right. It's in his name I pray. Amen. Pray for their strength. Pray for them to be able to stand through this. Pray for God to do amazing things. All right, so you can do that now. Just kind of move around however you want. Find somebody you're comfortable with. Sarah may be coming around. Just so Kyla and, and Justin and Brent and Avery can see who's here and who's praying. Don't let that bother you, please.
1 Peter 5.10, we're reminded that all the saints everywhere need prayer. People are suffering everywhere. I'm so thankful for those who don't necessarily attend this congregation, but who understand that saints need to pray together when things like this hit us. Thank you all for coming. May God bless you and keep you throughout the week. Amen. <laughs>